Okay, everyone, welcome to our uh, week seven lecture session. We are going to talk about geographic information system in this lecture. So we will understand what GIS is after the lecture, and uh, we will uh, look at some examples of uh, GIS maps. Uh, and by the end, you will be able to list and describe the different GIS data formats and uh, we will go over uh, the uh, analyzing method uh, in GIS, which is interpolation. And um, you will be able to list the steps of creating a GIS by the end of the lecture. A typical GIS contains multiple layers like this. The base map of the area, which is a, a Light, real life map like this, and there are some other uh, more abstract layer like the land use layer, which is a survey map, elevation layer, uh, parcel network layer, a street map, and the most important one, the data point layer, which is usually from the user's own data point and sits on top of all the other layers. Definition from USGIS about GIS, USGS about GIS is um, a computer system capable of assembling, storing, manipulating, and displaying geographically referenced information. Here are some more information about the fundamentals of GIS. A GIS is an organized collection of computer hardware, software, geographic data, and the personnel to efficiently capture, store, update, manipulate, analyze, and display all forms of geographically referenced information. As you can see, we can do a lot of things on the GIS data. A GIS integrates spatial and other kinds of information within a single system to provide a consistent framework for analyzing geographic data. Just as what we did in our last lab session, the spatial relationships can be summarized or manipulated. There are more definitions of GIS. GIS is an internally referenced automated spatial information system for data mapping, management, and analysis. So here we show an a example set of georeferenced data, uh, which means the geographic, uh, geographic data contains location on the Earth's surface. Uh, the data layers for precision farming, for example, is shown in this attribute table where we have latitude, longitude, and the yield and moisture content information for each location. In this course, we introduce two GIS data formats, which are also the two main formats in GIS, the raster format and the vector format. In raster format, the space is divided into cells, and each cell in the structure has a value. A group of cells with the same value represents a feature. Think about this as a picture with pixels. This is a simplified raster map example. You can distinguish three types of uh, uh, raster cells. 1s, 2s, and 3s. And in this example, 1s are the residential area, 2s are the water body, and 3s are the farmland. The second format, vector format, is a coordinate-based represent coordinate -based representation of map features. There are three data types, which we already introduced in our first lab session points, lines, and the polygons. Point is stored as a single xy coordinate. Line is stored as a pair or a set of xy coordinates. Polygon is stored as a set of xy coordinates which enclose an area. 
the previous raster format example can be represented by this vector map on the right side of this slide. Let's now compare the formats into more details. For a line data set, the raster format represents the feature by a set of square cells, while the vector format represents the feature by a set of vectors, here shown as yellow arrows. It's a similar case for a polygon data set. A raster format uses a bunch of pixels, like cells, to form the cell, the area while the vector format uses a series of arrows to form the closed map area. And here are some more examples of raster versus vector formats. So the middle column are the real world objects that are needed to, uh, that needs to be represent in, represented in GIS. And the left column are the raster view, the right column it, are the vector view. So in the first row, we are mapping some points. The raster view points will be, each point will be one uh, raster cell. And in the vector view, each point is a point data type. And similarly, for lines and polygons, uh, the most interest, interesting one will be is the last row where we have contour maps. Contour maps. This example reminds you of the questions I asked in lab four where you answered the soil sampling designs. So the first map was shown in the vector format, uh, which is like the right uh, side of this example. And the second map in lab four was in raster format, which is uh, very much like the lower left raster map shown in this slide. So now you can practice generating raster and vector maps by yourself to understand better. In this example, there are agricultural field, rivers, and a pond. When you make, make a map, either raster or vector, you need to represent each of these features in a proper manner. Since this is a video lecture, uh, I will just skip this practice. And if you have a paper and a pen, you can start to draw the map to the raster cells or with the lines, points, and polygons. Now let's compare the raster and vector maps. Raster formats are efficient when comparing information among array arrays with the same cell size. Means if two maps can be overlapped, then it's very easy to use raster format to compare them. While the vector formats are efficient when comparing information whose geographic shapes and sizes are different. So if there are a lot of variations, different shapes in different, different areas, then you might want to choose vector formats to work with. Raster files are generally large because each cell occupies a separate line of data in the attribute table. Vector files are much smaller because a small number of vectors can precisely describe large areas. Uh, third comparison. Raster files tend to be relatively coarse and imprecise. Thinking about too many cells will take a lot of storage space, like images. Vector files can be very precise because um, one vector type can represent a lot of uh, a large area in the in the map, so you can have more precise uh, presentation of the features in the map using by using vector form. So GIS hardware includes computers, digitizer, scanner, plotter or color printer, PC card reader, and uh, high resolution display monitor.
and uh, here are some old-fashioned ways of scanning and digitizing paper maps. Example use of PC cards. The best example is from precision agriculture, where we get a yield map from a yield monitor. What we get from the yield monitor is exactly a GIS map, usually with yield information by weight or by column, by volume, and moisture content information. So at least two layers from the yield monitor. For software modules, GIS includes data input, data storage and management, data output and presentation, data transformation, which is the geostatistics part, and user interface or interaction. So every time we work with uh, ArcGIS, we open, we open ArcMap. ArcMap is the interface of the GIS, ArcGIS software. The creating steps of GIS include first create a data layer and then enter data either by digitizing or scanning or in our case uh, downloading from the homework and uh, then lining up data with existing layers and then storing the layers and then uh, smooth and interpolate the data to get a full map and in the end print the map layouts with all necessary items like the title, the north arrow, legend, scale bar, and data source, data resource. So let's, let's go back to the question that I have asked in uh, other, in the previous lectures. What kind of GIS layers are there for precision agriculture? So this is uh, just a quick revisit. Uh, layers can uh, include soil type, soil moisture, nutrition, EC map, uh, rainfall map, yield map, uh, moisture content map, uh, temperature. All these type of information can be GIS layers in precision agriculture as long as they play an important role in making uh, agricultural management decisions. So when we try to interpret maps, we need to have extensive knowledge of the field's, field's history. And accurate maps are always essential. Uh, soil type maps vary, vary little over time. However, some other data layers vary annually, like nutrition, for example. So when GIS is used in precision agriculture, the following basic GIS functions from the definition are all very important to use, such as spatial query, data manipulation, and data analysis. An example of precision ag GIS layers is shown here. Six layers are included. Soil thickness, dry matter, plant height, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Among them, can you tell which changes the most frequently? Of course, it's the plant height, right? We know if this is from the cornfield in the crop season, then the plant height can vary day by day, and it can uh, grow several inches per week. We see that there are variations in among the layers. In each layer, there are spatial variations in every layer. But how can we quantify the variations? This goes back to the semi-variogram. Semi-variogram is used to quantify the spatial autocorrelations in a field. Remember, there are three factors that we look at in semi-variograms. The range, the seal, and the nugget. So some simple questions from this semi-variogram for two fields. First question is, 
according to this semivariogram, which field has higher semivariance at the distance of 25 meters. So to solve this problem, we draw a vertical line across the 25 meter uh, axis, 25 meter bar. And then we can see that field 2 has higher semivariance. Second question is, which field has larger range? This is quite straightforward after our last lecture's practice. So field 1 has larger range. And for question 3, field 1 has greater seal. Larger range and greater seal for field 1. So besides GIS application in precision agriculture, there are many other places that utilize GIS, such as power outage mapping. Based on the customer's outage complaints, the field technicians, technicians can find high-density outage areas and focus their work geographically. And they can also update uh, their working results in real time using the GIS system. Another GIS application is in forestry where the helicopters can fly over to provide the fire location and the fire parameter data via GIS, GPS, and the mapping technicians can provide the field crews with new map information every few hours, keep it, keep it updated. And the approach focused, the, this approach focused effort can save tons of dollars. So GIS is very useful, but it also has constraints. For example, data availability. We know that we need to collect, collect soil data points if we want to do soil sampling, right? But there is limitation sometimes due to budget. So data availability might be one GIS constraints in some applications. And data quality in three dimensions spatial attribute and temporal. Think about a satellite image layer for GIS. It of course in today's technology has relatively lower spatial quality compared to some other remote sensing layers. And spatial data scale and costs are really based on the budget. So Budget is the main GIS constraints. OK, we are approaching the end of today's lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email, and I will reply as soon as possible. You can also ask me, ask me during this Thursday's uh, uh, lab session or next week. OK, see you on Thursday. <laughs>